fall and what we hope to accomplish later this year. Slide. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar with the OPEN Act, our, our goal here is to dramatically increase the number of therapies available for rare disease treatments. Um, and a mechanism of action for the bill is to repurpose existing therapies for rare indications. And um, we uh, cleverly named this rare purposing. Um, and we found that in repurposing, it's more cost effective. Uh, we could get treatments to patients in their lifetime, um, but it's really under leverage due to the small patient populations uh, of rare diseases and many companies um, are not interested in, in repurposing for rare uh, diseases. Um, rare disease companies do a great job of repurposing drugs uh, for uh, rare disease drugs for other rare diseases. Um, but unfortunately, what we're looking to do is try to encourage those um, big companies who aren't interested in rare diseases to, to try to focus on um, uh, repurposing the drugs for, for rare disease patients. And how we propose to do this is to create an incentive um, for companies to do that. And um, that incentive is a six month market exclusivity extension. Um, it's modeled after the best pharmaceuticals for children act. So right now, if you study a drug in children, companies get a six month market exclusivity extension for studying the drug in children. Um, and what we're asking for is for the companies to get a six month market exclusivity extension for um, not only just studying the drug in rare disease populations, but actually getting it on the label. Um, so it's actually a higher bar than BPCI. Um, next slide. Um, these are our co-sponsors and um, huge shout out to um, Representative Butterfield and Bill Rackett in the, um, in the House and um, Senator Hatch and Senator Menendez in the Senate. Um, we are very grateful for our co-sponsors um, and uh, hope to keep continuing to collect them. Um, but as you can see, we are very bipartisan um, in our actions. Next slide. Um, so what we um, are looking to do, uh, I talked a little bit about this, but um, most of you know, and, and many of you who are patients on the line, um, are using off-label treatment. Um, and there's a lot of issues with off-label treatments and the fact that they are often might not be reimbursed by your insurance companies. Um, some uh, physicians are um, reluctant to prescribe on-label. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, patients are using drugs on-label, that they're being reimbursed by, drug or by insurance companies and that um, we have the appropriate safety and effect, um, efficacy data so we know correct dosage. And that's the, kind of the, the purpose of doing on-label versus off-label. And, and the, even if the drug fails in a repurposing trial, um, that's really important to know. We don't want patients taking off-label medicine that are, aren't actually doing anything. Um, so we, we really see that this is a critical um, component to advancing the science for rare disease therapies. Um, and then we also um, really look at this as potentially bringing low-cost drugs to rare disease patients. So um, as we know, uh, major market drugs are typically priced much lower than rare disease targeted drugs. Um, and so our hope is that by repurposing, um, we can bring on a whole new uh, basically industry of these drugs that um, can be available at major market drug prices. Uh, if we look at the results of how BPCA was affected, the Best Pharmaceutical Children Act, it actually resulted in more than 500, 500 labeling changes. Um, and as many of you know, we only have about 500 FDA-approved therapies for rare diseases. And then this is where we believe by creating this incentive, we will actually be able to double the number of treatments for rare disease patients. So um, that is a huge amount of um, investment and uh, uh, for our community and, and, and just so many more patients would have access to these treatments. So um, we're, we're very, still very excited about this legislation. Um, next slide, please. Just to progress to date, we have 268 organizations who are supporting the Open Act. So this is very much a rare disease community bill. Um, we're, we're happy to lead the efforts, but this is a, um, a, a campaign that's been 
run by many, many organization partners, and we're very grateful to all of those who have supported us. Um, as you might know, it actually was passed in the part of 21st Century Cures, um, but unfortunately it did not make it um, into the final bill uh, due to um, a cost issue because, again, any sort of bill that does anything will have some sort of CBO score and you have to have a pay for it. So that was one of our um, issues. Um, one of the things right now, as you all know, there are many, many competing hot issues in, um, in the legislature, everything from DACA to the budget, and um, right now making another rare disease bill after the passage of 21st Century Cures, a huge priority of, cha of, um, of Congress is, is really difficult and why we have great champions as co-sponsors. Um, you know, we really need leadership to champion and we really need, um, you know, co-sponsors who are willing to um, kind of place this above all other issues in order to make it happen. Um, one of the things that we're very, very excited about, we actually ran a letter campaign. Um, this was the first time we've ever done a non-patient-focused uh, target. Um, we wanted to see <clears throat> if the general public cares about rare disease therapies, uh, and we were really excited to see that we actually generated, in six weeks' time, 27,000 letters to Congress um, from the general public. Uh, so there is actually broad support of this bill, but it is still up to the patient community to go and educate Congress about why this is so critical um, for rare disease patients. Next slide. Um, we have, uh, you know, received some opposition from Congress. I know I'm listening very briefly, but there is some concern about drug prices. Um, but we, you know, there has been a lot of opposition from members of Congress. Uh, there's concerns about exclusivity gaming. You've seen that in the media. Um, and. Uh, so this is kind of what we are facing in opposition. We've also um, been uh, really hit hard. Public Citizen uh, is being funded by some outside sources to um, run campaigns against this legislation. Uh, Public Citizen is a group that uh, supposedly represents consumers, um, but uh, I think it's very critical that patients should have the decision power over whether or not they receive um, access to treatments, not just patients, or not just consumers in general. Um, and many of you guys knew, uh, were aware that the orphan drug tax um, credit was cut in half um, during the tax reform debate. So, um, you know, this, that was a huge concern that we're, you know, we're not in a fight, we're in a fight just to protect what we have right now. Um, and um, so pushing additional incentives forward is gonna be incredibly difficult. Next slide. But again, we want to make sure that we are still advocating for this bill because we believe this is some of the best hope for our patient community to, um, to really be uh, vocal and get access to treatment. So patient organizations can still sign on. If you aren't signed on, if you're not one of those 268 organizations signed on, you can please contact Rachel um, to sign your organization on. Um, Open Actor will be one of the apps uh, for the upcoming lobby day uh, for, uh, during rare disease week on Capitol Hill, so advocates will have the opportunity to advocate for the open act if they want to. Um, uh, so there'll be one sheet for that and there'll be some training on the open act for our advocates. Um, we also want to hear from advocates, and you can contact Rachel again about this, but um, are you guys on, is anyone on an off-label drug that wants to share your story that we could kind of put together these these stories of patients who are being either either on an off-label drug or being denied access to a drug, or is there a drug in your community um, that you think would work for you and, and you just don't have access to? Um, we will be scheduling a call of action um, uh, in the first day of March for people to call their members of Congress to support the Open Act, um, and we hope that that will uh, kind of remind Congress that this is a priority that we would like to see addressed. Um, thank you all for your time, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Julia. We actually do have a question for you. Uh, is, 
if there is any opposition, advocates want to know if there are any, you know, uh, people in Congress and the Senate and the House said that they could call to talk about the OPEN Act specifically. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I'll, I'll just be very clear, there's no member of Congress right now who does not want to give access to, rare, to treatments to rare disease patients. It's not necessarily an opposition um, to rare disease patients, um, and but the opposition, uh, uh, and especially from the Democratic side, so if you do have Democratic members of Congress, there's a lot of concerns about the high cost of drugs, um, and they're just a little more timid than uh, our typical, uh, the typical kind of political stance uh, about supporting the biopharmaceutical company. Um, and I think what, as patients, what we need to remind them is that, um, you know, industry is critical in this role. We, they're the ones who develop the treatment. Um, and patients won't have access to treatments unless industry is incentivized to, um, to develop them. And I think, um, you know, in the tax bill, industry, you know, received a, a, a huge tax benefit. But unfortunately, that tax benefit is not targeted towards rare diseases. So now they have more incentive not to develop rare disease therapy. So we lost. Um, a lot of ground in that tax bill, and, you know, I think we need to uh, educate Congress about the need to, you know, give something back to our community to make sure that these companies still care about rare. Um, because we have a lot of companies that care about rare uh, because of the great incentives that advocates have been um, uh, advocating for over the last 10 years, but those could go away, and we, we need more. I mean, with 95% of our patient community that have no FDA-approved approved therapies, the status quo is not good enough, and we need to demand more. So if any of you guys have, um, you know, Democratic senators in your state, uh, any Democrat coming on board is hugely helpful. Um, and, you know, I, I would encourage you to reach out to them. If you have leadership, if, you're, if your member is a leader in the leadership position, um, certainly would be helpful for having phone calls to their offices. Um, so for the Senate, Alexander, Senator Alexander um, and Senator Murray are the leader, uh, leaders of the Committee of Jurisdiction, and so they're, they're great people to, um, to make phone calls to. Um, any other questions? Thanks, Julia. I'm actually getting a lot of uh, messages on chat about people who are taking drugs off-label. So if you could send any story or information we could take to the Hill with us, email our client at everylifefoundation.org. We'd love to hear your stories. Thank you, Julia. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Sabah. All right. Um, so I will be talking briefly about Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. This isn't the deep dive webinar. We'll be hosting that on February 15th. So I'm just going to be touching on some of the events we host during that week. This year, Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill will be taking place between February 25th and March 1st. So, and if you've already registered, that's awesome. Um, this event gives uh, patient advocates, caregivers, researchers an opportunity to network with each other and meet with their legislators about policy issues that are important to them. And this is a series of events aimed at empowering the patient community, whether it's just advocates or caregivers. Um, so it's a great opportunity for everyone to get together. Uh, this is just a list of the events that we'll be having. So on Sunday, February 25th, we'll have a cocktail reception of bill screening. On Monday, we'll host a legislative conference. On Tuesday, there'll be a lobby day breakfast followed by a lobby day. On Wednesday, we'll have a rare disease congressional caucus briefing. Then that evening, there'll be a rare artist reception, and Thursday will be rare disease day at the NIH. Registration opened on January 3rd, and you can go to that website right there, rareadvocates.org slash RDW, to register. So um, on Sunday, we will hold a documentary screening, cocktail reception, and panel discussion. This will be held at the Naval Heritage Center, and we'll be serving hors d'oeuvres during the reception. 
Um, this year, the featured movie is The Ataxian. It centers around Kyle Bryant, who's a rare disease patient with Frederick's ataxia. And the documentary actually follows his journey in 2010 when he was on a four-man team in the world's toughest bike race across America. It's a 3,000-mile bike race from San Diego to Maryland. And I think it also it also gives a peek into the families of other FA patients. I think it's a really inspiring film. So the documentary screening will be a great place to not only watch that film, but have a panel discussion afterwards. We'll probably hear, we'll hear from Kyle on the panel, and then um, there'll be also a broader discussion following that. On Monday, we'll be hosting a legislative conference to help advocates prepare for their Hill meetings. Um, which will be the next day after that. Everyone will also have a chance to meet with their state groups and network with each other. This event is really intended to train advocates on how to effectively communicate their story and build good relationships with their legislators and their staff. Um, we'll also hold different breakout sessions. Some of these will be Lobbying 101 or Young Adult Advocacy, and some will do a deeper dive into legislation for people who are veterans or, you know, have some experience um, with lobbying already or meeting with their legislators. This is required if you want to attend the lobby day the next day, so you have to go to the legislative conference if you want to attend the lobby day. Um, we also have a family room to accommodate advocates who can't attend without bringing their children, though you know, ultimately we prefer that you not bring your family, but we completely understand if, you know, you don't have another option. And for that reason, we have this family room. We'll have a remote broadcast of the main hall's proceeding in that room and families will be welcome to join for lunch and coffee breaks to network with other attendees. Um, just to note, parents will be responsible for their children at all times and can't leave them unattended. Then on Tuesday, we'll have a Lobby Day breakfast. This is the morning of the Lobby Day. It's a good opportunity to hear from speakers, get together with your teams, get amped about your Hill meetings. Um, we'll feature speakers from the NIH and FDA and usually members of Congress also speak at this. This year, we'll have William Gall, who's the clinical director of the National Human Genome Research Institute and director of the Undiagnosed Diseases Program at NIH speak, along with Deborah Lewis, who's the acting director of the Office of Orphan Products Development at the FDA. And it's also a great opportunity to ask questions from those people. The rest of the day will be filled with meetings on the Hill, both on the Senate and the House side. Soapbox Consulting is working with us to arrange these meetings. Um, this is when advocates really get the opportunity to educate their legislators, so things that they've cared about for a while, things that, things that they've learned about at the legislative conference. Um, we request meetings with the members themselves, but a lot of times they may be handled by staff. Uh, there's no requirement to talk about any specific piece of legislation, though we'll be providing a menu of our, you know, things that we think are really important for the rare disease community. We also like to encourage advocates to create their own asks and take them to their hill. Uh, depending on your team, you'll meet with senators, um, and your representative's offices, so you'll usually meet with both of your senators and then either just your representative's office or multiple representative offices. Um, the day following that, we'll host a rare disease congressional caucus briefing in the Russell Senate office building from 1230 to 1.45 p.m. Um, these will cover, these usually cover policy topics that are important to the rare disease community. Our topic for this year is the life cycle of rare disease from diagnosis to treatment. So um, one speaker will provide an overview of the entire life cycle and then each of the other speakers will provide a look into each part of the rare disease life cycle and the policies that impact that. And um, these events are usually attended by congressional staff and it's a really great opportunity to educate them about uh, things that are important to the rare disease community. Later that day, we'll have a rare artist reception to recognize the winners of the rare artist contest. Uh, the 
event will feature a collection of art from across the rare disease community and individuals voted on Facebook to pick their winners. We had for a few months voting was going on, people were submitting their artwork and um, others were voting on Facebook. The 2017 award recipients are available on rareartist.org and this event will also take place in Russell Senate office building in the same room, the Kennedy caucus room. Um, Rare Disease Day uh, at the NIH will be on March 1st. Uh, registration is now open, it's on that link. Um, Francis, I checked out the agenda earlier and Francis Collins will be speaking along with Chris Austin and even leadership at the FDA, so it's a really good event. Uh, if you wanna register, you can just go to that link. Um, it's also on the RDLA calendar and on our Rare Disease Week website. Um, travel stipends, so we have been providing people with travel stipends. We provide them for people to attend Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. We understand that not everyone has the means to come out to DC and get a hotel for a few days to attend all these events. Uh, we had more than 500 applications this year. Um, we still have one stipend available in New Mexico, South Dakota, and Hawaii. Uh, people in New Mexico and South Dakota are awarded $800 and Hawaii 1,000. Um, there's still no applicants from Wyoming. So if you are from any of those states, feel free to apply. Um, for those on the wait list for other applications, as soon as those spaces are freed up, we will let you know. Um, I know some individuals have been reaching out to us about that. Um, we also have a room block available. We have plenty of rooms left. If people are interested um, in getting a room block, if you've already registered for Rare Disease Week or have gotten a travel stipend, um, if you call that number, you and um, say that you're with Every Life Foundation, with, under the group name Every Life Foundation, you can get a room at the reduced rate. So um, I definitely encourage people to do that. This Washington Court Hotel is located right by the, the hill and it's really convenient for all of our events. Service animals and welcome on one side is complimentary. Let me know if you have any other questions about that. Um, and before I sign off, I wanted to give you some information about our next webinar. That'll be a deep dive into Rare Disease Week, how to create an ask, what to wear, where all the events are, how to get to them. Um, any of those questions will be addressed on that webinar. You can find, once we post the registration for that webinar, it'll be available on, on our website again, rareadvocates.org slash RDW. Um, so, if you want more information about Rare Disease Week, definitely attend that. Um, I, um, I should also mention about the room block. Once the room block closes uh, over the weekend, the prices will go up. So um, I really encourage people to get rooms on the room block as soon as possible. Um, the next webinar for Rare Disease Week will also be recorded. They're, all, they're always posted on our website after they are recorded. And we also had a Rare Disease Week webinar in December and it is already posted. The recording is already posted on the website. And I should mention about the room block, um, the deadline is on Saturday. So if you want a room in the room block, definitely register by Saturday. All right, if I, I am not really seeing any more questions and there are a few that I um, see that I can respond to directly in email, but thank you all for attending this webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you.